So I'm joined by Jonathan Chaffee, the co-founder of the Radical Independence Campaign in Scotland. It was a major player in 2014 as the campaign for independence went up from the mid-20s, I think it was polling, all the way up to 45 uh, on the eve of the vote. Of course, it didn't win, but nobody's, nobody was expecting that kind of improvement in the vote. It was within touching distance of creating an independent Scotland. Welcome, Jonathan. Um, we've got so much to talk about. Obviously, that uh, campaign was in 2014. Since then, we've had the rise and the relative fall of the SNP, the renewal of Labour with Jeremy Corbyn. So that meant a few seats going Labour's way in Scotland uh, in June. So I'll start with this. If there was a, a general election in three or six months' time, how many seats would the SNP win or lose? OK, well, to kind of answer the question about where the SNP vote um, is going, we have to draw back slightly towards the referendum. Um, you're right to say that the um, support for independence went up hugely um, in a very small um, scale of time. So it went up from about 20% to 45% and is now permanently around the 45% mark. The reason for that, in my view, uh, wasn't because of a nationalist impulse or, um, or a, any kind of patriotism as such but because there was an opportunity to vote against austerity, against the Tories, against New Labour. And in that sense, it was organically radical, in my view. Because if you look back, it was range against that movement of ordinary people. It was the banks, most of the media, there was only one paper that supported independence, uh, the financial institutions, and Project Fear, which was designed, of course, by Better Together. So it was a radical movement um, in broad terms. And in 2015, in the general election, the SNP tapped into this. They pitched themselves as being anti-austerity, as being a thorn in the side of the British establishment, and they won great rewards from this. They won 59 MPs, a huge, huge number, historic, complete political hegemony. But the problem, I think, comes when they think to themselves, OK, we've won that section of the working class, it's now time to orientate ourselves in the corporate boardrooms. So instead of using this hegemony, to directly appeal and to continue to appeal to working class Scotland by doing things like replacing the council tax, which they didn't do, or by pursuing a seriously radical programme of land reform, um, which, which they didn't do. It's meant that a section of their post-2014 surge has uh, fallen away to an extent. Uh, and that was always going to, but I think it's been exacerbated by that kind of leadership, which has been to moderate towards the centre. Um, and of course, this has come alongside the development of Jeremy Corbyn, um, who is seen as a kind of anti-neoliberal, anti-establishment figure, who obviously excites lots of people in Scotland, lots of people who, by the way, voted yes, are also excited um, by the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn. And I think the combination of these things makes the political terrain very difficult for the SNP at a general election. So to answer your question, there is no safe seat in Scotland. And that's quite a turnaround from 2015. If you look at the 2017 results, many seats were won by very small margins. Indeed, one was won by two votes. So there's no safe seat. There was a Tory surge. There was um, a steady increase in the Labour vote to an extent. They won back some territory. I think with the possibility of a Corbyn Prime Minister in the next three to six months, if that's when an election, that's a realistic option. And I think that Labour at a general election would do well because of that. But I think that underlines that lots of what's driving Scottish politics is a left-wing agenda. So I'm obviously a, a big fan of Jeremy Corbyn. I'm a Labour Party member. You are a fan of Jeremy Corbyn's politics, but you are still campaigning for an independent Scotland. I'll briefly state where I think Scotland should stay in the Union, and then you can, sure. you can make the counter-argument. I would say that Britain uh, is better together. I never thought I'd be saying that a couple of years ago. Because we now have the possibility uh, of a parliamentary majority at Westminster alongside a social majority in the country which is highly politicised, highly mobilised and a radical left-wing Prime Minister overseeing a radical project of both economic reform, anti-imperialism, changing global institutions. Now Britain is a medium-sized power but as a hangover of our colonial uh, past we, you know, punch above our weight when it comes to the G7, the IMF, WTO. Now I would say to a left-wing Scot you could be part of this, and even if we only achieve 30% of the things we set out on, that's significant reform. Sure. Could be on a par, say, with the remaking of the world order after 1945 and NATO and so on. We could do that, or you may go off, have a separate country, and actually be very affluent, you know, have a, a country that's equivalent to Norway or Sweden in terms of wealth, and maybe even with fewer 
income inequalities. Out of those two alternatives, as a left winger, what would you take? This is a really important discussion. And by the way, I don't come at it from a, dog a dogmatic um, point of view. First about Corbyn. Corbyn is a, probably the most authentic political leader that Britain has seen in the modern era. And I think that's what's galvanised so many people behind him. But I think it is important to point out that I don't think Corbyn's a product of the Labour left, necessarily. If you remember, he struggled to get on the ballot paper first time round. He only got on by the skin of his teeth. And actually, it's the build-up of a whole series of social processes, social movements, um, a feeling in society, um, a frustrated feeling, needing to find voice. And they found it through Jeremy Corbyn. And there was this huge influx of people into the Labour Party. Now, I think that this carries a whole range of strengths. What Corbyn's managing to do is not just to challenge for power, but to change the terms of the debate, uh, which is hugely important. Um, but in Scotland, the political terrain, in my view, um, is quite complicated. Unlike England, where the whole left is behind the Labour Party, I mean, really without question. In Scotland, it's not. It doesn't mean that everyone who's not behind Labour <coughs> is behind the SNP. But it does mean that there are some quite deep issues when it comes to the relationship that many, many working class people have with the Labour Party because of the 2014 experience. So from my position in Scotland, um, I uh, want to be in a position, uh, along with a range of other people, to be able to bring together sections of people who agree with independence, sections who don't. But that doesn't mean there's not tactical questions. I'll give you one last example. If Jeremy Corbyn was the Prime Minister, um, I would not be arguing at that point in time for there to be a Scottish referendum. Because A, I don't think it would win. B, I think the arguments would be very difficult. And C, I think that there's a, a real sense in which uh, the independence movement could be hijacked by people who essentially want to break the Corbyn government and build a neoliberal Scotland. So I think that's a really important distinction. And just lastly, everything that we are discussing hinges on, absolutely hinges on, in my view, the strength of the extra parliamentary movement. This is, to me, the, the fundamental thing. To me, it's not about joining Labour, um, although that's important, uh, particularly in England when you're going through reselections and so on. It's about having a focus on what happens if Corbyn's elected and there being an extra parliamentary movement. That goes for the same if Scotland was to win independence. If Scotland wins independence and there's not a radical social movement that can forcefully express itself, onto the political situation, it will be captured as well. So that to me is the essence um, of the most important strategic element of, I would say, the situation. But, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, re I'll reset the question then. Forget Labour. Yeah. If, forget Corbyn even. But if the end result here, when we're old men, when we've got white hair, mm. 25 years time, on the one hand, you have uh, independent Scotland, um, a world leading in renewable energies, high tech, great food exports, GDP per head higher than Norway, very low income inequality, or Britain, mm -hmm. slightly higher income inequality, not perfect, mm -hmm. not as far down the road when, in regards to say, a, the, the development of socialism, but has played a major role in the recasting of global institutions while also undermining neoliberalism in one of the primary centres uh, for that paradigm. What would you take? Well, um I think the question of Scottish independence isn't just about you know the living standards of Scots, although that's clearly central. It is about dismantling the British state. And this is, I think, important because maybe this is where we have a difference to kind of explore. You're talking about a Britain under Corbyn or under a socialist government um, going and being able to transform global institutions and so on and so forth. I think that uh, that is uh, optimistic, but it's optimistic on the basis of there being the possibility of the British state itself being able to transform these kinds of institutions instead of the British state and its various arms, the army and so on and so forth, reforming the Labour Party out of its radicalism. That's why I think the extra parliamentary is so important. The reason why I say that is because I think the, the, the institutions at the global level are going to have to change anyway. I think we're at This moment, is a good point, yeah. I mean, so the question is, in which way do they go? And, you know, I talked to a few people around the Mélenchon project. Mm. They're you know, they're quite positive about uh, the outcome of a French presidential race several years down the line. We don't know what's going to go on in the US, but unless the Democrats go with a relatively <laughs> radical candidate, I think Trump would win a second term, personally. I agree, I agree. 
So let's be very optimistic and say yeah, okay. we have Melanchthon, we have a left wing um, Democrat nominee and a left wing a progressive Democrat nominee yeah. and they win the presidency. All of a sudden then between Corbyn and those two, these are three players. If you can get a bit of buy-in from elsewhere in the global south, China, for instance, mm -hmm. just those four can really change the terms of the game, can't they? Whereas Scotland by itself, you know, like I say, it could be an analogue to Norway, but it can't play the game at that level. Definitely. Right. So it's not about but see, it's not about Scotland playing the game at that level. It's about Scotland dismantling the British state. It's about Scotland breaking British power, right? Um, I don't think that we can um, do the things that you're talking about without there being a major con confrontation with the global capitalist system, right? I know you agree with that, right? But but what 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 that looks like, what forces are involved, um, to me is important. I think the left has to far more adopt a politics of rupture in that sense. Um, I'm opposed to the EU, uh, for example. I think one of the one of the really interesting dynamics is the idea of a Corbyn government happening outside of the EU. How does that play itself out? Uh, I'm in favour of a pan-European movement, and I think Corbyn can play a huge role in that. Um, but I do think that the national question. If you're operating in Scotland, you have to take a very nuanced view of. It's not going to be the case that you're always on the front foot when it comes to independence, but it is the case that that question is going to exist, and it has existed, of course, for a very long time. Um, but I mean, you know, if Corbyn comes to power and gets drowned out by whole sections of the ruling class, uh, then Scottish independence suddenly then becomes much higher up the agenda. My view, though, would be that if Corbyn comes to power, the absolute priority for everyone regardless of where they are in the UK, is to defend that government against the onslaught that would in inevitably come, but also to challenge the government as well to, to turn more to the left. Again, and I keep coming back to this, that's the need of extra parliamentary movements. How best do you build an extra parliamentary movement in Scotland? I don't think it's necessarily by being a member of the Labour Party, which cuts you off from quite important sections of people. The Tories did surprisingly well in the uh, in the last general election in Scotland. Mm. Have they got seven seats now? Some of this, yeah, more? yeah, I think more. I have to double check, but yeah, they've they've done they did well. Yeah. What's the future for them? If the SNP vote does go down a little bit, if Labour do a little bit better, we thought the Tories were dead and buried in Scotland after 1997. Do you think in the long term they're going to sort of slightly come back as the voice of reactionary unionism? I think that the Scottish Tories did well in the last election because what they did was, as you point out, was they crystallised their entire campaign as opposition to independence. If you wanted to support the union, you voted Tory. Simple as that. So Ruth Davidson is uh, being entangled in the crisis of the British state and of the British Tory party. And there's only so much that they can distance themselves for. It's worth remembering that Ruth Davidson was very public in campaigning for Remain. She doesn't like uh, the relationship with Donald Trump. Uh, she has built her political brand on being a progressive Tory. That's very, very difficult for her to do now, when at the same time she can't lash out against her own party. So I think the Scottish Conservative uh, Party is going into a period of, thankfully, I think it's going into a period of relative plateau. I don't think it's going to increase from here. And I would very much hope that it can be overtaken by the Scottish Labour Party. I've made a number of jokes about how... Uh... You know, if, if Richard Leonard wins, Labour will overtake the SNP in Westminster polls, not Holyrood polls, just for clarification. Sure. How possible is that? I think that's very possible. Um, because if you look at the last election, I think I've kind of mentioned this in various formats before, is that there's no safe Scottish seat. Uh, I mean, if you talk to SNP MPs, right, they'll tell you this. I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, right? Um, one seat, I think, was won by like two votes, another by 60 votes. When there's the real possibility, the realistic possibility of Corbyn becoming the Prime Minister, I think that'll be attractive to many, many people in Scotland. And it's really important that the SNP begin to develop a theory of the crisis. I think Alex Salmond, for example, does have a theory of the crisis. He understands the nature of populism, he understands the nature of the crisis of the British state. I'm not sure the present SNP leadership does. They think that a managerial approach to politics will break through into the kind of popular, uh, into popular uh, discourse and sentiment. I don't think it does. I think people want politics which is based on a real determined, um, uh, vociferous attempt to completely alter how our society works. Finally, Richard Lennon's just been uh, elected as the leader of the Scottish uh, Labour Party. We could have a general election 
next year? Probably not, but I'd say maybe a 40% chance. It's perfectly possible. Can you foresee a situation whereby the people behind independence could be advocating a Labour vote strategically, even if Labour were a party of the union, mm. were promising some kind of constitutional convention um, immediately following a general election, which is being talked about quite widely. I think John Trickett would oversee yeah, it. Definitely. Do you think those two conversations about a constitutional convention for Britain and then something like Devo Max and another referendum being promised under certain conditions, a bit like the Good Friday Agreement, is that, is that possible for you? Well, I think that, I mean, to me, the idea of a constitutional convention is a good thing, right? I mean, uh, the, you know, that's, that's a good thing to happen. However, because of the nature of the no campaign in 2014, one of the things that it put forward in the days running up was a vow. And this was a vow about more powers going to Scotland, about more devolution and so on. And that wasn't delivered. In fact, the repatriation of powers from Brexit, right, is, is now even in, in contention, right, about where they go. And so because people feel that they've been sold up up, to put it like that, um, then the ability of Scottish Labour to be able to convince people who voted yes or, or who voted no on that basis, right, is very difficult. Um, I think people um, will vote Scottish, well, will vote for Labour in a Westminster election. I think Scottish Labour still has huge challenges. I mean, one thing I would say about Richard Leonard is he's not Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Richard Leonard's a GMB official. I mean, he's not, I, I'd have to check, but he doesn't have the kind of uh, standing as being a, a permanent rebel inside the Labour Party that I think Jeremy Corbyn has, certainly not the profile around it. And Corbyn comes from a different, I think, political milieu, and I think that's more exciting for people. But there is a reason why the huge phenomenon in England that's existed around Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, thousands of people coming out to see him and so on, hasn't translated in the same way as Scotland. It's important for us to think those things through. Um, but yeah, I think that I think there's every possibility that many people who voted yes would vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I equally think that um, their vote for Jeremy Corbyn uh, would also uh, should not also be taken as a vote for the union. I think it's much more complicated than that.